So I think I'll go for a little review first before we go talking about the tutorial questions. Um, so I think first is talking about uh, multi-dimensional arrays. So multi-dimensional arrays can actually be in any dimensions, uh, whether it's one dimension, two dimension, or three dimension. Can go even to four, five, six dimensions, but then like the reason we don't include it is because most of the times we cannot visualize it anymore. But then, yeah, um, never discount the fact that uh, arrays can be in many, many multi uh, multi dimensions. Sometimes just the data structure can be quite complicated once it gets big because it, you know, it just grows exponentially. Uh, okay. So I think this is an example of real life. Uh, uh, example of arrays in real life where in lecture you guys see cars. Uh, I'll use this as an example. Um, where the top one, as you guys can see, is a two dimensional array where there's like a person standing in line one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. While this bottom one is like a two dimensional array where you can form like rows and columns and each person in the group can be referred to as the index of rows and columns. Yes, that's a good question. Where's the three-dimensional array? Unfortunately, like it doesn't make sense for people to be stacking on top of each other. Three-dimensional means like this particular part over here. Right? Wait, let me turn on my pointer. This particular uh, row, uh, group of people will be stuck on top of each other, which is quite ridiculous. So it doesn't make sense. So I'll use another example for a 3D array, which is used in lecture as well, which is a picture. Uh, yes, a picture is, I know I'm using that picture to grab your attention. Okay, so uh, an image, uh, technically an image is a 2D array. Like it's just a group of uh, pixels. Like that, it's just like every pixel is a dot on the picture, which represents a color. But then though each pixel can be broken into three different channels, red, green, and blue. Every color is a combination of a little bit of red, a little bit of green, and a little bit of blue. So you can actually split them into three channels. So in this case, it's a 3D array where there's the rows, the columns containing the pixels, and each pixel contains three different channels. Yeah. Uh, Great that you guys are awake already. Okay, so um, this is a visual representation of a 2D matrix uh, represented in row call. This is the rep same representation that is used in class as well. Hmm. It hey, don't be like that. Like, I'm trying to be relatable here. Um, this is the sample of a 2D matrix. Uh, that this is the representation that is used in class. So if you can see that uh, first we create the arrays for the rows, and then in each row we insert a column. I know the column looks like a row, but then like, you know, it kind of looks like you know each row. And then this is a column, column one, column zero, column one, column two, column three, and column four. Okay. So. Yeah. This is the representation that is used. La. I know that this doesn't use the box pointer diagram, but this is a good enough representation to understand like how does row calls work. Another possible representation is if we flip them around, if we use call row instead. So we create the list for the columns first and inside each list, we insert uh, the calls one by one in which each column contains uh, items from each row. Right. Now the question is, uh, which one to use, the row call or call row? And the answer is actually up to you. Um, basically, uh, if you, as long as you can be consistent in your, uh, you know, if you can be consistent in using row call or call row in all your coding, right, then it's fine. If you cannot keep it consistent, then that's a problem. Lah. For CS and then you will use row call. I think most of the time. So I think it's recommended to just stay with row call. But then in the future, if you want to use a different implementation, it's really up to you. Like, there's no much, there's no rule to it. You just need to remember that a 2D, 2D array is more, um, it's more of a 
way of us to write a data structure that is useful in many cases rather than like a rule in Python. Okay. So um, I think this is uh, an example of a 2D array. When we try to access it, to access a 2D array, you usually have a for to double a nested loop usually. So if you can see, we look through x, which is the range of plan x. So we range this first. Then for y in range, the length of the, one of the objects inside ls list n. N means like it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, like it's really up to you. I think the right one is list uh, x. La. And then lastly, it's just like print list x, y. So in this case, you can iterate through the um, nested list nicely. You can go through the items one by one as you iterate through one, two, three, four. And then once it's done, it will go to the next row. Okay. So that's all for the summary. Are there any questions so far? If there are no questions, maybe a thumbs up. Just Mutul giving a thumbs up. Nice. Okay, it means. Okay, now let's just see its uh, application, which is our tutorial question today, which is first we'll go for matrix. <coughs> so first, uh, we can represent a matrix by a list of lists, like this. Four times ten. Da, 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 da. You know, see, like we have the outer list here, which is contains the rows. And the inside is basically containing the columns, uh, column 0, 1, 2, 3, and etc. So you can assume all the in entries are integers. You can use functions that are provided in lecture. So, so I'm going to open my, I'm going to open uh, the file that is given during lecture. For those of you who don't have the file, uh, I strongly recommend you guys to download the file. Damn it, where's the file? Oh no, I lost the file. Okay. Oh no, that's very important. Give me a moment. Uh. Let me look for the file. Meanwhile, for those of you, uh, for those of you who uh, who don't have the file, download it first. So you guys can do the tutorial questions as well. Did we go? I have my file with me. So there may be a lot of the code online, but you want to try to code yourself. And yeah, technically NumPy also have all these features, but we don't want to do that. So see, we have all the codes here. Quite amazing. So yeah, uh, I think we'll just uh, use this. I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to transfer it here. Okay. All right, cool. Okay. So next part is going to be uh, the first part, transpose. Write a function transpose M to transpose an RC matrix to a CR matrix. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, basically transpose, right, is um, uh, converting the rows into the columns. So like this row particularly here becomes the columns and the columns becomes the rows up. So for that one, right, um, I think it's a bit complicated. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I strongly encourage you guys to actually uh, Google it up. Not Google for the code, but Google how to transpose. And the best source is actually Wikihow. Uh, It's very nice because Google How provides pictures and everything nicely. So I'll try to use this as a reference. 
So if we can read through here, like uh, we can start with a matrix, right? We have a matrix. Yeah. And then after starting the matrix, the second instruction is turn the first row of the matrix into the first column of its transpose. Rewrite how one of the matrix as a column. And then repeat for the remaining rows. So it's, you know, rotated. It, it even works for non-square matrix. And lastly is the last part, which is the most important part express the transposition mathematically. Um, there are two uh, no, basic notation here, if you guys can read. The first is that if matrix B is an M times N matrix, uh, M rows, N rows, then the transpose matrix BT is an N times N matrix, okay? That's the first information, that the result, right, is an N times M matrix, and for each element B, X, Y, in B, the matrix BT has an equal element at BYX, okay? So I think with that, let's start coding. Alright, um, def transpose, say you have a matrix, alright, so with this matrix, uh, Let's try to figure out some parts first. Let's uh, first of all, we want to iterate through the um, items in the index. Uh, so no, sorry, items in the matrix. Because remember, we want to shift right from x y to y x. So we want to go through for um, x in row for y in call. The new matrix. equals to matrix row x y according to this formula if in the original matrix is at x y the matrix the position in the new matrix should be at y x so we're gonna swap them up then there you go and then simply you return new matrix Okay, there are some problems with this. Can uh, can anyone point out the problems here in the chat? There's a lot of problems here actually. Mm -hmm. All right, that's one of the problem. New matrix is not defined, so let's define that. Row and column is undefined as well. Well done. Okay. Row. Okay, so the question is like, what should be the new? So the new matrix here is technically the new matrix. It should be an empty box. Um, hence, we now can create an empty box, which in which the, the prof has provided, which is we can create a zero create a zero matrix. The question is, what is the parameters inside? Right. Remember if, uh, I think now it's time to use the first line. If matrix B is an M times N matrix, then the transposed matrix BT is an N time, times M matrix. Hence, if the original matrix has uh, the, the it uh, has the length m and the height of n, then the matrix BT should be the other way around. So let's try to um, swap them up. And then for the row call, um, basically we wanna, usually when we deal with matrices and we wanna iterate, we wanna know the length. So the length of the row is uh, matrix land matrix and the length of the call is matrix say zero or you can do minus one as well as long as you get the length of the the list inside the nested list it's okay 
And now, um, the final touch, since our row and call is actually an integer of number, of the length of the matrix. So technically, this one, we want to change it a bit into range instead of just row. Because technically, you cannot iterate for a number. Let's try. Say transpose M1. Let's see if it works. Uh, Okay, you guys didn't see. Okay, so this is our code. Wait, let me just remove this part first. Oops. What? What? All right. All right, so this is the results. Like, uh, you get the transpose one. See, like, you just need to iterate through and just trust the process. Lah. Trust the formula. In this case, we just use a formula here given, which I know you guys are not given, but then, like, uh, confirm during exams, you'll be given the formula. It's just, yeah, this tutorial, we kind of slip up. Okay. In this case, this is our first way of doing dealing with matrices where we try to iterate through the values of the input matrix. Okay, take note, which in this case, we iterate through the input matrix. Okay, now we're going to go to the second question in which in the second question, uh, we are actually going to try another way of dealing with matrices. Which is, um, yeah, this is the code. Um, okay, before I move on to the next task, uh, maybe are there any questions? If there are no questions, maybe give a thumbs up. All right, then I'll move forward. Next task is slightly different. So the next task is basically, we are given two matrices, A and B, and we need to compute the multiplication A, B. We'll need to multiply A and B, such that, uh, you know, we have one matrix, and this is the formula. And yeah, don't worry about the formula yet. So, um, yeah, I think don't worry about the formula yet. Lah. I think, uh, okay, Maybe like just uh, give a little sign. Uh, can you give a thumbs up if you are familiar with mu matrix multiplication and can you give like a clap if you are not aware of matrix multiplication? Okay, okay. All right, I think uh, quite a lot are not aware. Cool. And there's someone throwing a party, sure. Okay, so I think some some things to uh, deal with matrix multiplication is that uh, matrix multiplication has a prerequisite before we can actually multiply. Not all two matrices can be multiplied. So if you pay attention here, we have matrix A is a M times N matrix. Oops. Matrix B is an N times P matrix. Okay. So the requirement is that um, the first matrix must have the same uh, the same column as the second matrix. Second matrix is row. You see these two are n, and the product is an m times p matrix. So the product is the the number of columns, uh, the number of rows in matrix A, and the number of columns in matrix takes the number of columns in matrix B. Um, 
that's one the first thing to take note of the ordering of the matrix matters so in this case you kind of need to take note hence with this right let's try to code that first Even two matrices, matrices M1 and M2, we need to check whether the role of M1, sorry, the call of M1 is the same or not with, is the same or not with call of the row of M2. I think instead of using M1 and M2, I'll use A. So it's same as the uh, tape, uh, the slides. So how do we get this? I think the first the first part is the easiest. It's just like get all the all the rows and columns of the matrices. Standard. I hope you guys understand what this means. Why I'm doing len add. I'm gonna make it look feisty. Okay, cool. So we already get the rows and columns of A and B. Now it's time to check. Right. If call A is equals to row B, then it's okay. Lah. But then like I think I'm gonna inverse it a bit. So if it's not the same, then I'm gonna return false. And maybe write uh, some error message. Okay, and then next, uh, we'll do. Now we'll start doing the multiplication. Now, in our first solution, we iterate through the input, but then here we have two inputs, and it can be slightly complicated. So what we do is perhaps what we want to do is iterate through the answer input. Oops, yeah, thanks a lot for pointing at the HA. I think I typo. Okay, actually, before I move forward, I'll try to explain what multipli how the multiplication works. <coughs> so, um, okay. if you are in CI, right, if you are in If you are in C21, right, what you'll do is you'll actually do a pairwise multiplication of A uh, of row two in matrix A and uh, column one of matrix B. So C21 will be equal to the multiplication of these two plus the multiplication of these two plus the multiplication of these two and multiplication of these two. So you kind of get the gist of it. Lah. So you get the rows and you get the columns and then you just multiply pair, pairwise multiplication. Okay. So um, what's nice about it is that it's already encapsulated in this particular formula. Cij is equals to A, I, K, B, K, J, and then you sum them up. The i and j refers to the position in the uh, final matrix, and the k right refers to this sum, meaning that we kind of know that there must be some sort of looping, some sort of iteration to iterate through the value of k. So let's do that. So let's try to get the value of cij. The value of cij. C i j is equal to the sum of uh, all the possible values of a i k times b k j. But then we the value of k is arbitrary; it keeps on changing. It needs to be iterated, so we cannot do this way. Can I need to create a for loop now?
In this case, uh, k is iterated through the range of n. As you can see here, it's iterated through the range of n. And we just need to change the plus this side to a plus sign, plus equal sign, because basically we iterate through the value of k and we just keep on accumulating the value of a, i, k, b, k, j. Now we have defined the value of k. Now there are some values that haven't been defined yet. For example, i, i, j, and uh, Who is that? Um, okay. Uh, please don't surprise me like that. If you want to ask a question, maybe send a chat first so I can, yeah, so just don't give me a heart attack. So I think the first thing that we want to do is we want to iterate through the matrix Cij. Right, so we know the matrix Cij, the rows are M and the columns are P. So for I j in range p then we'll just move the indentation forward cool lastly is the value of n what is the value of n now if you remember earlier the value of n is equals to the value of this which is either the column of the first matrix or the second matrix row the length of the row of the second matrix so we'll define that as well n is equals to call A, which is also happens to be equals to row B. So it's up to you whether you want to equate n with call A or row B. It's up to you. We also haven't defined M and P as well. So let's define M and P. M is actually the row of A. And P is actually the call of B. Okay. Lastly, is our final matrix. We haven't defined the matrix C yet, so let's define it. C is create zero matrix of M and P. Once we're done, we'll return the matrix C. Right, so say we have uh, a create random matrix of like say um, 3, 4, B is create random matrix of 4, 5, then we can p print methmol of A, B, just a shy. Oh, unexpected EOF while passing. Oh, that's a bit weird. Oh, okay, shit. Um, all right, this one. Oh, okay, A is not defined. All right. Uh, so we say here name A is not defined. Let's go to A. Okay, this is, don't forget, uh, like your error, I hope you guys can already read uh, error statements, but then like most of you sometimes still ask. So in this case, we get a name error, and in this line 72, so I'm going to go to line 72, and yeah, I know that my A is not defined, so I'm just going to change it to A, and I, for, I need to change it to B as well, because they are not defined. The ones that are defined are capital A and B. I'm going to run it again, and finally we get the mathematic multiplication. I think that's a bit ugly. I think uh, that's going to use M type print instead. Uh, never mind. Yeah. So, yep, that's how you actually uh, <coughs> do matrix multiplication. Um, what's interesting here is actually we um, iterate through the output matrix because in this case what we know is that there's a one function that actually binds the, the earlier two input matrix into the output matrix. So in this case it's easier to iterate through the output matrix. 
the procedure is more or less the same. We can, usually we look for the length of the row of co and column of the input matrix and see how the length of the row and column of the input matrix affects the output. And then we create the output matrix. And then we do an iteration through one of the matrices and do calculations. In fact, these two lines over here can be replaced by by the same, the good old uh, list comprehension. If you are, guys are love list comprehension, then you guys can do this. CIJ sum of this particular term for k in range n. This works as well. And this should be much faster. Okay. Are there any questions for uh, matrix multiplication? If there are no questions, maybe a thumbs up. Oh, Kelvin and Yeche, what's wrong? If you guys got any question, feel free to let me know. Can you explain the loop again? Um, yeah, uh, sure. So the loop here actually loops through the output matrix which is state C. So here in this case, we created a C in this part over here. We created a zero matrix in this part. And then we know that from the slides here, the zero matrix, the output matrix, right, is an M times B shape matrix. For I in range M, this one loops through the rows loops through the rows of the matrix here. And uh, J in range P, it trades through the columns. Hence, when I do see IJ, right, I access the, I accesses the rows, which row, and the J will access the columns. K, K is the, summation here like uh let me clean this bit part a bit uh k is actually this part over here so we know that the formula for cij is equals to the sum of a i k b k j for k from one to n so we kind of need to iterate the value of k from one to three to the value of n Okay. which can be replaced by a uh, list comprehension. Yes, correct. I tried to create the Python function as close as to the formula as possible. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, let's just move forward. Okay. Uh, so we now have done like, uh, we iterate through the input matrix, we iterate through the output matrix. I think, uh, let's go to the third question. The third question is slightly different, slightly unique. Uh, the third question is minor matrix. So you need to write a function minor matrix M I J to find the minor matrix of M without uh, row I or column G. Okay. 
So the definition of a minor matrix is not a formal definition per se. It's not a definition in math, but then it really helps our calculations data in task four. So let's see what happens with minor matrix. So what we want to do is we want to remove row I, the one that is highlighted in red, and we want to remove column J as well. So this is the third way is the, uh, this task right uh, tackles on the more like, uh, how to say, quite hardcore, not hardcore, uh, more nitty gritty of the arrays of two, di di two dimensional arrays. So maybe anyone has an idea on how to do this, on how to actually remove a values from a list. Anyone in the chat? Yes, you can do a pop. Can use a remove, yes. Delete. Delete is for uh, dictionaries, by the way. So yeah, you can just first remove the row first. And then after you, the general uh, algorithm is that you remove the row first, and then after you remove the row that you want to remove, then you iterate through the rows, and then you remove the column that you want, okay? So I'm not gonna like go deep into details. There are many, many ways to do it. You wanna do it using pop, remove. The ones, the suggested key un answer key is using uh, list slicing. So if you can see here, this is the first step of actually removing the unintended row and not desired row. And the second part is the part where you remove the undesired column. Okay, I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds to actually try to understand the code and after 30 seconds we're gonna uh, move forward. If there are any questions, just uh, shout it out, okay? If there are no questions, if you guys understand the code, then yeah, it's good. So this is another way in we're de in dealing with matrices, lah, where we really create the new matrix from scratch. If you see output is actually our new matrix and we really create it from scratch and basically we append the new matrix inside the new matrix. So we don't use create zero matrix, but then we simply just create it from scratch. Technically, you can use create zero matrix and then yeah, you look through the values one by one and you use a for loop. Like if it's I, then don't insert it and etc. But it's going to be complicated. So this is the third way of dealing with matrix is that you just create a new matrix overall. Mm. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm a sleep deprived person. I know it's I'm unprofessional, but I'm quite the remove method. Um okay, uh remove method. Uh, okay, sure. Okay, first let's see, because I, okay, I don't remember the remove method well, so let's see. Okay, I think the remove is quite hard. Um, no, I think we cannot use remove because remove takes in an element as the input, but well, what we want to remove is the index. So let's try to find something that where we can remove the index instead. Oh, we'll use pop. Yeah, we'll just use pop. Thanks, Calvin. 
we'll use pop because pop because like we are given the index of the row and columns right so what we want to use is pop so again uh def minor matrix m i g okay say uh here do a deep copy of m because we don't want to change the original value of m then we simply like uh, m dot pop on the row that we want to remove which is row i right and then like uh, for i in m uh, range m we want to like m i Uh, m i dot pop j. Yeah, I forgot whether it's in place or not. Oops, my bad. Actually, no, it's actually in place. So, yeah, you want to do this. Step. Return m. Okay, so this is the other way of the using pop. The reason why we use uh, list slicing is actually list slicing is uh, computationally faster. Computationally faster than pop. Uh, if you guys are interested in the reason, you guys can ask me later. But if you guys are not, I don't blame y'all. It's a bit uh, yeah, complicated. Okay. So yeah, uh, this is the way we do use pop. I think some of you already understand how it works. Basically, we use the index, we remove the row first. The ordering doesn't matter. If you want to remove the columns first, then you remove the row, it's perfectly fine. But it's less efficient. So it's really up to you. Okay, going to the next part. I think I'm not gonna use. I think I'm gonna. I'm not gonna use this. Okay. Next part is the determinant. So assume the input A is a square matrix. No matter. So I think this one is an important assumption. Assume that uh, input A is a square. Oops, that's a triangle, a rectangle, square matrix. No matter how big the matrix is. There is a way to calculate the determinant. Uh, if you don't know what a determinant is, just imagine that there's this now. Every matrix has a particular number that is associated to it called determinant. It's like the height of someone's body, the height of someone to uh, associated to a person, something like that. So we can calculate the determinant by this way. So we can iterate through the top row, right? We can iterate through the top row. And after iterating through the top row, basically uh, what we do is we multiply each item in the top row. So in this case, this is A, this is B, this is C. We multiply it with the determinant, another determinant of the minor matrix. The minor matrix of the rows and columns not associated with that particular iteration so in this case it's a b remove the row that is associated with b and if it's not c remove this part if you can see that the rows stay the same so it's definitely row zero but the columns change according to the index of the iteration so the rows depends on the index of a index of b index of c okay So this is for a uh, two times two matrix, a uh, three times three matrix. So if it's a four times four matrix, say we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. It's gonna be, we iterate through the top part, A times F, G, H, J, K, L, N, O, P, minus B, E, F, H I sorry E G H I K L 
M O P plus C E F H I J L M N P minus D E F G I J K M N O. Okay. So if you can see, right, there's some sort of recursive pattern here. Yes, there's a, some sort of recursion. If the minor is not a two times two, it's not, it's a recursion. So I think for this, let's try to figure, let's try to code it out first. Right. Uh, So let's define a determinant function matrix, right? Um, the value of a determinant is initially zero. Then now what we want to do is to iterate through the first row. Matrix zero because we want to take the first row, which is matrix zero. But then technically, right? Technically, right? Um, you don't have to do matrix zero. You can even simply do matrix matrix. Just the, uh, calculate the length of rows because it is mentioned that the input A is a square matrix. Even even better, I think I'm just gonna put it in a size in a variable called size. So it's more intuitive later on. So what's the value of the, the, the determinant is determinant every time we iterate through we add these terms. So we know A times the determinant of a minor matrix matrix. So it's gonna we get A from uh, just taking the value of A, which is at the original matrix. It's at row zero and the column keeps on iterating through, multiplied by the determinant of a minor matrix. So we're gonna copy this. M, I, okay, uh, let's gonna change this into J to represent columns. But then the I, right, the I is already fixed at zero. So we're gonna just simply hard code this as zero. I mean, if you wanna make it super nice, right? You can just do this, uh, and make make the code more readable. Okay, this one is nice. Uh, yeah. So um, remember that this is a recursion, right? Uh, if the matrix is great, it will keep on calling the minor matrix. So we kind of need a base case here, okay? So for those of you who are unaware, matrix matrices has some sort of base case. The determinant of matrix has two base cases. One is when the size is zero. Sorry, if size is one. Else if and L if, if size is two, okay? If the size is one, meaning it's a one times one matrix, it means the determinant value is simply the value of itself, okay? Return matrix zero, zero, okay? Now, if the size is two, there is a formula. You can look it up on the internet, uh, but I'm just gonna mention it here because it's not, about the coding, matrix zero, zero. Okay, so that's the value of the determinant if the matrix is the two times two matrix. So I think I have the slides here. So in this case, the 
2 times 2 matrix, right? Uh, say we have E F H I. The value is E times I minus F times H. So it's a cross. E times I minus F times H. So the top part multiplied by the top part minus by the other two corners. Okay. And I'm going to use green for positive. So for those of you who don't know, now you know that you can calculate the matrix of a 2 times 2 matrix right away. Okay, so once we're done, we simply can just return the value of the determinant. Okay, now let's try. Say we want to calculate of a determinant of a 4 times 4 matrix. Say x is... Four times four. I say a uh, better five times five. Wait. Oops. Okay, so uh, there's a problem here. Um, our name M is not defined here, correct? Because our matrix name is not M; it's matrix. Integer object is not iterable. What? An integer object is not callable. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for correcting. Uh. But it should be okay though. Why is the integer object is not callable? Got the matrix right. Um, let's see. All right, thanks a lot. But then I don't think that's the problem, though. Hmm. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I understand. Um, okay, uh, yeah. Shit. Oh. Oh, okay. Life, life, life is tough. This index is out of range. What? Anyone want to help debugging? It's quite hmm. it's weird though. That it could be out of range. Hmm. Okay, for the minus one times uh, to the power of j, I'm gonna touch that later. Actually, I'm gonna touch that later. But then I've already defined i equals to zero here, so it should be okay. That's weird, it shouldn't work. Code should have worked. Damn it. I'm gonna touch on the negative one after this.
I think something's wrong with my minor matrix here. Did I code my minor matrix correctly? Yeah. I copied the code correctly there. Ah, uh, anyways. Okay, um, no, it's supposed to be M0, matrix 00, because if matrix 00, because if you just return matrix 0, right, it's going to return an empty, it's going to return a list. And let's just try it. Um, mm, Let's just try then. Uh, let's do some debugging. Oh boy. Oh, what? Ah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My minor matrix function is wrong. No, no, no. So, like, the determinant function is okay. Um, the determinant function is okay. The My minor matrix function is wrong. Yep. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I mean that's live la yes, yeah, like the debugging part, like if you're in CS or any computing mod, like uh, basically that's the tough part la. And I think there's, uh, Calvin mentioned something about the negative one, which I'm actually gonna touch later la. So if you notice right, um, if you notice right, um, actually there's the alternating part. So we are alternating between a positive, negative, positive, negative, and we can do that using this negative to the power of i. Uh, if you want to know, if you, if you're a math whiz, like you kind of can know why it can, that helps uh. Why is it negative one to the power of uh, j? Say, why is it negative one? Because if j is zero, then this will be one. If this is one, it's going to be negative and so on. So it's, you know, kind of what we want. How do you do the part where the c multiplies the determinant part? What do you mean, like, how do you do this part? Like, this one is the formula. Like, this is kind of the formula, lah. Like each item is multiplied by the minor matrix of the associated item. So in this case, we iterate through the index of the range one by one. So we can uh, remove the columns one by one. Okay. Are there any questions? Wow, that de debugging took 10 minutes on its own. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, I suggest you guys review this uh, tutorial later on, maybe during your free time.
I'm going to move forward to the next part. So we're done with actually uh, we're done with task one now. Uh, we're done with part one already. Um, and there's an extra practice um, if you guys want. Um, do it on your own time is this one. If you remember the question from PE, right? Calculate areas. You need to calculate the areas of white, yellow, and red. Now try to calculate area matrix where you return the the return value is the 2D matrix of the areas of each particular box. I think this would be quite a great practice. Let me take a screenshot of that. I think that would be great practice for you guys to try, you know, just to like exercise your brain muscles. Okay, next up, we have the maze. Okay, uh, for the maze, uh, let's have a one minute break before we move to the maze, shall we? Let's just take a drink or stuff. I, yeah, just take a break first. I'm, I'm quite out of breath now. Okay, one minute is up. Let's okay, let's try. So we have a maze. Uh, we have a maze like this, and the maze is defined by an R times C grid. So the row is defined this way, where zero is the pathways that you can go through. And uh, block is one la. Okay. So in in this maze, you can only like move forward, backwards, left or right. You cannot uh go diagonally. So the first function, first thing is like uh you need to create a random maze to generate such maze. Okay. So yeah, um, a maze is solvable if we can go from 0, 0 to n minus 1 to m1 minus 1. Sorry, we create the random maze first. And for create random maze, um, this is where it comes important. I'm going to use another function that is provided in lecture, which is create random matrix. But then what makes random matrix is different from random maze is that I want to random maze, the value is only between 0 and 1. So instead of 0 to 9, I'll just pick 0 to 1. Correct. Correct, yes, yeah. Correct. So very correct. So we'll, it's easy as that. Alone. I just copy paste and it's done. Okay. But yeah, I know in PE, you cannot copy paste, you cannot see your old notes. So just make sure that you guys understand how to create an empty maze. Lah. But usually, I think these kinds of functions usually will be provided. So you don't waste time. If you can see, this is similar to the patch task tree, where you kind of like create your own matrix from scratch. We have an output container, and then you start building the rows one by one. And then once the row is built, you append it to your original matrix. All right, so task one is done. Next is task two. Task two is solving the maze. We want to know whether the maze is solvable or not. If you can go from zero, zero to n minus one, n minus one. So it's, it's going to look something like this. In this case, this is solvable. So you can go trace like, ooh, we going down and up and down and up and down. See, there's no diagonal pathways. It's just like either front or back. 
And it's not solvable if there's a, it's not solvable like, if there's a, you know, a wall that passes between that from the left to right. The wall is this way. Ta-da! Okay. This is the wall. You cannot go through. So the question is, um, but then from a start point, you can actually reach all the points. As you can see here, you can they can reach here and reach here or reach here. So the question is like, how do we actually solve the maze? How, how do we know that 0.0, .0 can reach n, n minus 1, n minus 1? Okay, time for brainstorming time. Ideas, anyone in the chat? Any ideas really? If you don't know, just say don't know. But do you have any ideas? No, not Stack Overflow, Liao. So just just use like a very pseudo code-ish language. Like on in English, right? How will you do it? Correct, you'll definitely need a helper function, but then like how do you exactly do it? I mean, um, not necessarily, like in this case, I mean, that's a good observation. That's a very good observation, but that's not helpful. Uh. Yeah, let me try to find. I'm not so sure whether you guys played Among Us or not, but um, if you guys know Among Us, right? Um, there's and if you guys played at this map, this is basically we're also the same thing. We try to connect from the start point to the end point. And uh, what's unique about this thing is that um, once you go forward, you cannot go backwards. So, like, say if you actually hit a, a dead end, you kind of need to start from the beginning again. Okay, so I think the principle is very similar with this. You from the start point, you just go, and if you meet a dead end, you'll start again from the beginning and try another path, and see all the places that you can explore. Okay, so if, uh, in a nutshell, it's correct. You kind of want to follow all the paths of zeros. Mark the path with one. Uh, you don't really have to mark it. That's a better way, cause like once you mark it, it's a bit dangerous. So yeah, the idea is you just anyhow go. So uh, wait, uh. you just anyhow go lah. Um, okay. So I'm gonna uh, introduce you to a new algorithm called the flooding algorithm. So the flooding algorithm is, uh, I'm gonna represent it in my little trip to Bali. Um, yeah, you know, let's just take a little step back and relax and learn coding while we enjoy some things. Advanced topics will be on breath or death first search, search. Yeah, uh, no, I'm gonna use this example to explain about the flooding algorithm that we're gonna use. So the, basically the point is that we just want to search all the possible places that we can reach from the starting point. And basically if the end point or the destination that we want to achieve is in the places that we can reach, then it's fine. Then it means we can reach it. Not that easy. Here we are. Give me a moment. Okay. So uh, why I use Bali as an example? Because yeah, I, I personally I really love Bali. Okay. Um, um, this was my trip earlier in January 2020 pre-pandemic. Yeah, you know, and times were still good, and you know there were no disasters, nothing happening. 
No, I don't want to hear some Indo from you, Derek. Your Indo is terrible. Um, this is my sister, my wonderful and beloved sister. We were, the top picture is at Jimbaran Beach where we were eating grilled seafood on the literal beach. So like, you know, you're literally sitting on sand. And the bottom part is uh, me with my sister at Kuta Beach behind a hotel. And yeah, it's just like my favorite place to go to every year. So, excuse me, this is not Alabama. Yeah, like, you know, there's the music, playing music. Excuse me, this is not Alabama. This is my sister, okay? How dare you? Anyways, so now we're, uh, we just flew from Changi Airport to Murah Rai and Pasar Airport. Okay, we have arrived in the Pasar Airport and we want to ex because we have been so exhausted and so deprived of vacation because of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we arrive in Bali, we want to explore all the places that we can go in Bali. So what I'm going to do is that I don't know the places in Bali, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a bucket list. And for every place that I visit, I want to see what are the other places that I can visit from my current place, my current location, and add it to my bucket list. Okay. So I start with Denpasar Airport, and at Denpasar Airport, I can see three places that are connected with Denpasar Airport, which is Kuta, Gunut Bolong, and Ubud. So I'm going to add them to my bucket list. All right. I'm going to add these three to my bucket list. So I'm done with the airport. Now I'm ready to travel. I'm going to take one place from my bucket list, which is Kuta Beach, and I'll go to Kuta Beach. Kuta Beach is the place where the you can go to surf, but the surfing place is not really good. And there are some good malls as well there. You're now at Kuta Beach. Now you repeat the same process. You want to see what are the places that I can go. I can go to back to the airport and fly back to Changi, but that's not our intended desire. But there's also Balangan Beach and Nusa Dua. Okay, so there are three places. Then Pasar, Balangan Beach, and Nusa Dua. Now these three places, right? one of them are already in the visited location or uh, so because it's already i've visited them before i'm not going to add it back to my bucket list because why would i revisit a place twice i add balangan beach and nusa dua to my bucket list once i'm done with kuta i'm gonna pick again one more item from one more location from bucket list and go to that place nusa dua now from nusa dua i've seen kuta i've I can see Kuta Beach, at Kuta and Balangan. Now I visited Kuta before, and Balangan is already in my bucket list, so it's quite redundant if I add them back. So at Nusa Dua, I enjoy the beach, I enjoy the beautiful hotels and the good buffet, and there's a club there. I enjoy my time there, but I add nothing to my bucket list and or my visited list. I go to Balangan, same there. All the places that I can visit from Balangan has been visited before, so I'm not gonna add anything there. Now I'm done exploring the south. I'm gonna explore the northern part now. Now I still have two places in my bucket list, so I'm gonna go to Ubud first. In Ubud, I can actually go to four different places. Uh, then Pasar, Bulnut, Bolong again. Okay. Eh no, I can or oh, three places actually. Then Pasar, Pura Brantan, and Mount Agung. I'm gonna add Pura Brantan and Mount Agung to my bucket list because I visit the airport. I'm gonna visit Mount Agung, but then Mount Agung is holy. What? Go come back, break up, man. Well, excuse me. I went to Bali with my friends, and my my friends didn't have a breakup, eh? Mount Agung is secluded at the western side of the island, so um, I don't add anything. I visited Pura Brantan. Now Pura Brantan is neighbors with Bunut Bolong, Ubud. West Bali National Park and Git Git. Now, since Bunut Bolong is already in the bucket list and I've visited Ubud before, I'm not going to add them. I'm just going to add the National Park and Git Git to my bucket list. And I keep on doing that until Lovina, the West National, West Bali National Park and Bunut Bolong. And once I'm done with Bunut Bolong, then I've explored all the places in Bali and I'm ready to head home. Okay.
Okay, I'm, I, I feel bad for you, Derek, but no, I don't experience the Bali curse. If there's the anti-Bali curse, then that's what I experience. Okay, so I'm done with exploring all the places in Bali right now. Now, what's the moral lesson of uh, the, What's the moral of the story here? Is basically this question: From Benpasa Airport, can I visit Kuta Beach? Can I visit the West Bali National Park? And can I visit Nusa Penida? Okay. So yeah, uh, the answer for the first question is yes, of course I can visit Kuta because it's just right adjacent to it. I can visit the West Bali National Park because it's connected. And I can visit, but I cannot visit Nusa Penida here because it's separated by the bo body of water. So referring back to our original maze map, right? Our original maze map, the body of water is represented by the ones in the story. And uh, basically all the points are all the zeros that you can visit and connect. So the moral of the story here is that you can arrive at Nusa Penida if after exploring all the location places, right, Nusa Penida is at your list of visited locations. If it's not, then there's no point. Okay. And that is called the flooding algorithm. So first, what, what, what we want to do is we actually, uh, we want to get the possible neighbors first, right? Remember, remember earlier, um, yeah, remember earlier in this place, right? There are three data structures that are important. First, you got to keep track of your current location. You got to have a list of your bucket list. And lastly, you have a list of your visited. And every time you vis every time you change location, you need to be able to get the list of your neighbors. So in the maze earlier, right? In the maze earlier, you kind of need to get your list of possible neighbors. Okay. So I think uh, Nick mentions earlier. Uh, where is Nick? Uh, help create a function to check the zeros around a point. Yes. For a starting point, there must be at least one path to a point. For the rest of the point, there must be at least two paths. Um, that's a bit dangerous, lah. Cause like technically, it can come up to a dead end. So I think like first, what we wanna do is using the earlier algorithm, you wanna come up with all the possible places to go. Now, from this right, yes, you can go north, south, east, and west, but not necessarily the case. Sometimes we go north and we actually hit a roadblock. And if we're on the fringes, right, if we're on the very end, if we're on the very ends, you cannot go as well. Okay, because it's out of bounds. Okay, yeah, this maze is on a flat earth, where if you walk beyond the line, you'll fall into the depth of unknown. Okay. This is a, this is a flat earth. Okay. So, you kind of want to create a rule or function where you can filter out all the impossible neighbors. In this case, is the maze A, B equals to one, or basically the coordinates are out of bounds. Okay. Okay, so in this case, for example, we want to create a function, possible neighbors, to return a list of neighbor coordinates such that they are possible. Zero, one, zero. So in this case, if I want to take the possible neighbors at this position, uh, the possible neighbors are only top and bottom. There's no right, there's no left. And the coordinates are represented in this way. Next up is, so this is another example. Possible neighbors of 7, 4 is 6, 4 and 7, 5. <sighs> so this is the code for possible neighbors. We generate all the possible candidates for all of us and technically there are only four possible candidates. And we iterate through the candidates one by one. And we first check if they are, if the coordinates are valid, whether they are within the range of height and width. And if they are, we check whether it's blocked or not. Can anyone tell me why we check whether the coordinate is valid first before we check whether it's blocked or not? Why do we check for the validity of the coordinates before we check whether it is blocked or not?
correct. Uh, technically, if the coordinate is not valid, then uh, it will give us index error. Okay, so yeah, this one. So once you're done, if the output is valid, you insert it to, if the neighbor is valid, you insert it to output and you return output. We're done with that. Um, now it's time to solve the maze. Um, basically, uh, I collect all possible neighbors, a collection of S and I go try them, which is our bucket list earlier. If I go to a new place with new neighbors, I keep adding the neighbors to S. Remember, the keyword here is should be a new neighbor, okay? So it's not an old neighbor that is already in my bucket list or in my visit list of visit locations. All right. So I kind of need to keep track of the places that I've visited. Okay. So the code is, I start with this. I start with, uh, I, I do a very simple check like, whether the starting point is uh, solvable or not. Okay, then I keep track of two uh, uh, lists, which is visited and S, right? Visited and S. Um, Visited records all the positions that we visited before S records all possible neighbors we want to try, or in other words, it's a bucket list. And then while S, meaning that while S means that while while bucket list is not empty, S pop means take one location from neighbor from bucket list. Okay, this one is checking. Have we arrived? Have we arrived? If we have arrived, then we return true, meaning that it is solvable. If not, then get all possible neighbors. Okay, and lastly, this one, right? This one is a slightly different algorithm. This one is a slightly different part. So I think uh, I'm going to rewrite this in the way that we ex I explained earlier. We're using my example in Bali. If new position is not in both visited location and bucket list, then I'll append the new position to my bucket list. This is the code that we explained earlier, remember? Because, yeah, if your position is not in bucket list, uh, bucket list append, your post, but then at the end, you kind of need to, at the end, you kind of need to add visited at position. Once you're finished visiting it, you kind of need to mark it that you have uh, visited that location. Okay, um, now the code on the left, right, is the prof's code, and it's slightly different. This one, right, um, if you see the, the possible neighbors are both added into the list of visited and S immediately. The S one is correct, because like, you kind of want to travel to that location later on. But why is it appended to visited? It's because we have the assumption that all the locations will be eventually visited. Hence, if the location will be visited, might as well just add it to visited right away. We don't have to wait to go to that place to indicate that we are, have visited that place. So it's kind of an assumption that is made. 
And in this question, the assumption is indeed valid. Okay, lastly, once the bucket list is empty, right? Once the bucket list is empty, and we know that it means that we haven't arrived at our final destination. Because we know we haven't arrived at our final destination, it means that there's no new neighbors we can try, it means that it's not solvable, then we return false. Okay. Any questions regarding this algorithm? Okay, with that, I think I'm just going to show you guys an example of a code run. So we have this sample maze, 0011. Okay. So we have current position at 0, 0. We start at 0, 0. And then we generate the possible neighbors from 0, 0, which is only this particular one. So we add the possible neighbors to here, to the list of bucket list. Then we take items from the bucket list, which is 0, 1, and because our new current position, generate all possible neighbors and add it to S. And keep on repeating the process until we arrive at the end. Okay. So the idea is you go kind of want to expand all the neighborhoods. You just want to explore all the possible po possibilities. And the most important thing is you should not repeat the neighbors that you visit because if you can visit a neighbor that you have visited before, it's going to create a very complicated loop. Lah. So there's a challenge that you guys can try to do is that you can write a simple loop to find a maze that is solvable and you kind of can wish you should try to visualize the path is the part uh, if you guys can visualize the path that would be very great and if what's even greater is you can figure out what's the shortest path and the for the shortest path i think you guys can use uh that first search that would be great this one right definitely the implementation is slightly different than the standard implementation from when we, in this case, we just keep track of the coordinates, but for this one, you kind of also need to keep track of the pathing. If you can keep track of the pathing, I think that would be great. So today, uh, for part two, we learned about a glimpse of algorithms. Algorithms are usually a preset of instructions, you know, kind of a set of instructions that are very general and most people use to solve problems. A lot of problems can actually be solved by algorithms, pre a pre-made preset algorithms, template algorithms with little modification. And it's, it, it can be very useful to learn uh, all the algorithms that are out there. Indeed, there are some problems that cannot be solved by ordinary algorithms, but most algorithms can solve most problems. And in the, in the upcoming classes, we'll be talking more on algorithms. Some of you must have touched on algorithms in tutorial in assignment three when you are doing sorting. Sorting, there are several ways to sort a list. Uh, it's called the sorting algorithms. There's the bubble sort, merge sort. Um, I think there's binary sort as well. So there are many ways of sorting. And from there, you guys can learn like, how to sort stuff up. Okay, so are there any questions regarding past two, uh, the part two of today's uh, tutorial regarding the maze? Uh, I have this. Wait, uh, uh, I cannot see who. Okay, okay, let me. Who, who, who's that? Hi, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, just want to uh, ask if it's possible you could upload today's uh, tutorial right, uh, earlier. Like the video, the video. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, my bad. Uh, all right, all right. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, then I'll try to upload it by tonight then. Um, yeah, I'm kind of lazy to do that, but yeah. Okay, I'll try to upload it earlier. Yeah, thank you very much. Love you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Um, when is the tutorial slides uploaded? Um, the prof haven't uploaded the tutorial slides. I mean, for mine, for my tutorial slides, I think, uh, I mean, I only, if you guys kind of can tell uh, which one are my slides and which one are the prof's slides, 
uh, my slides are the ones that are colorful and has backgrounds usually, and the prof slides are you know the ones that are plain white. So yeah, usually the prof uploads a tutorial every week. So does that help answer your question, Ye Chie? Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? If there's none, then I'll just stop the recording here. Wait, why well, cannot put visited locations in again? Because you see, if you put visited locations, say, uh, yeah, in this case, right, uh, I put visited location again. So meaning that, say, in this case, right, I put and pass our back again, right? Right. After I'm done with Kuta Beach, I'm gonna go back to Denpasar. And at Denpasar, I'll add these three values again. And yeah, it will just keep on repeating over and over again. In a way, we want to be effective and efficient. We don't want to revisit places that we have visited before. And you don't want to get stuck in the infinite loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'll stop recording here.